Good afternoon. Since I became Attorney General, I have made clear that the Department of Justice will speak through its court filings and its work. Just now, the Justice Department has filed a motion in the Southern District of Florida to unseal a search warrant and property receipt relating to a court-approved search that the FBI conducted earlier this week. That search was of premises located in Florida belonging to the former president. The department did not make any public statements on the day of the search. The former president publicly confirmed the search that evening, as is his right. Copies of both the warrant and the FBI property receipt were provided on the day of the search to the former president's counsel, who was on site during the search. The search warrant was authorized by a federal court upon the required finding of probable cause. Happy Saturday and welcome to The Deal. I'm your host, Ed Clark. It is Saturday, August 13th, 2022. And we're so happy you took the time to join us uh, to talk about the news, catch up on things. Uh, we can't do this without having somebody to talk to. So as always, I'd like to bring in uh, Val Atkinson. Hey, Val, welcome back to The Deal. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good to be back, Ed. Well, you know, it's a lovely Saturday morning, and it's even better, Val, because last week, if people remember, we were talking about one Donald J. Trump maybe being in an orange jumpsuit. Now, we may be a little bit closer to that. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pinning all my hopes on it, but Val, in the intro, you saw Merrick Garland, who we have not said very nice things about. I know at least I haven't said nice things about Merrick Garland. Uh -huh. uh, I assumed that he was not doing all he could to look into the former president, number 45. But guess what, Val? They went down to Mar-a-Lago. They took a trip to Florida. And they raided the president's residence at uh, former president's residence Mar-a-Lago. Let's be serious for a second. And in, in there, uh, they found a number of boxes that contained in some cases, top secret information, and not only top secret Val, but information that should only be in a skiff. And for people who've been in the military or been in government service, you know that's a place where you go into where there's no phones, there's no way to communicate outside. And when you look at those documents, those documents stay there. Uh, they're under lock and key all the time. And apparently Donald Trump just had stuff laying out all about and not secured. And some of it may have even included uh, nuclear uh, nuclear secrets, uh, things about the president of France, all kind of things. So let me stop talking. Let me let me talk to you, Val. Uh, what is your <laughs> assessment of what's going on here, uh, and how's Merrick Garland handling the criticism from the right right off the bat? I am so glad, as a supporter of Merrick Garland, I am so glad that he is taking this position and taking this stance uh, on the whole business of making sure everybody is accountable to the law. Uh, because there's been too much talk uh, on the other side that have said that Merrick Garland wasn't as strong as we needed him to be. Uh, Trump gets away with everything. Uh, why don't we change the Constitution? and make it so that the president is above the law uh, and just let it go at that, that. All of that negative talk. This helps Merrick Garland, but more importantly, Ed, it's the right thing to do for the rule of law and democracy uh, within our country. This is what's important to me. You've got to show the American people that the American experiment is still alive and well and this country is still worth fighting for. And the system called democracy is something that can work, is working and will work in the future. You've got to make this happen or you're going to lose it. So I, kudos to Merrick Garland for what he did uh, down in Florida and, uh, and Mar-a-Lago. And uh, it ain't over yet, as you said, uh, but I think it's the start. I think this is just a start of starting to treat Donald Trump as a regular uh, 
citizen of the United States of America. And it should not matter that he is a white male who is conservative, he's straight, he's Christian, who happened to be the immediate past president of the United States. All of that stuff shouldn't matter. He shouldn't get any breaks for that. And this constitution has got to say that even if all of this stuff you have working for you, mm-hmm. you are still subject to the law. So yeah. I'm hoping, i got high hopes that uh, things work out well for Mary Carl. Yeah, you know, it, one more one more thing on that piece, Val, about not being above the law, you know, uh, Merrick Garland in, in the full press conference and it's out on the internet, you can see it. He cited specific parts of the U.S. code that, that uh, Donald Trump had likely violated that allowed them to do the raid in the first place. You know, there's been a lot of talk on the right about, oh, this is a setup. Evidence might have been playing it. You know, all, and, it and people like Lindsey Graham are saying it. Uh, Rick Scott, you know, uh, are saying it. Um, and, and why when uh, they're supposed to be the law and order people, have they all of a sudden turned on law and order? We've heard people even say defund the FBI, <laughs> Marjorie Taylor Greens and people like that. I mean, I, I don't take it serious, but fail, there are consequences to how they've framed it on the right, isn't it? It should be if it's not. Uh, people need to start questioning those people as to why you don't sing the same song for uh, your own people when they are charged that you sing for people who are supported by Black Lives Matter and other progressive groups. And uh, I think they're going to have some explaining to do. They can't have it both ways. Uh, They're going to have to start anteing up and playing by the rules or telling us why None of us should be playing by Right. Yeah, you know, I want to remind the folks you're listening to The Deal, or if you're listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your fine podcasts, uh, or if you're watching us, if you're watching the video version, we, we appreciate you so much for doing it. I remind you to ask your friends and family and uh, uh, colleagues and people you even hate to <laughs> subscribe to the deal because uh, we like to hear feedback from folks. Found, uh, another part of this is uh, Mary Trump, who is Donald Trump's niece, who knows uh, Donald pretty well. And she often calls him Donald <laughs> when she's talking to him. She doesn't say Uncle Donald. She says Donald. Uh, and uh, I want you to watch a clip of her on the Dean Obadala show. Um, this is just um, a little while before we even came on. Uh, where she's talking about who may have given up or ratted out Donald Trump. So according to the reporting, there is a Mar-a-Lago mole. Do you have any guesses? Do you have any idea who you, who benefits the most by Donald Trump going to prison? There's so many. There are, so it's so tough to choose. Um, I want it to be all of them. <laughs> you know, I, I think we need to start with who would have access to this stuff? I don't think Mark Meadows would have access to it. No, I don't either. Um, I think we need to look very hard at why Jared got $2 billion. We needed to look very hard at why he has been so quiet for so many months now. And we need to think about who, if it, who could also be implicated in this that would need as big a play as turning Donald in in order to get out of trouble or at least to, to mitigate the trouble they're in. It sounds like somebody in Jared's position. I'm not saying it's Jared, but it could be. <laughs> I don't know. We were going so Val, uh, Ivanka is married to Jared Kushner. Jared Kushner has his own legal problems. Uh, and there may be some shady business going on because Jared Kushner probably made around $2 billion while they were hanging out in D.C. And maybe some of those papers have something to do with that. Maybe Jared Kushner's trying to cut a deal. Mary Trump says she doesn't know. But when you look at that, uh, the request to go in there to warrant, you have to be very specific, Val, about where you want to go. So somebody knew where the papers were. And she says it's not likely to be Mark Meadows because, you know, he, he, he's probably out, got the outs with Donald Trump now. 
Uh, what do you think about somebody like Jared Kushner maybe being the rat or maybe even Ivanka or uh, or his wife, Melania, or someone like that ratting him out? Any of those are possible. All of those are possibilities, Ed. Uh, when you get to the point that your so-called closest friends and your relatives, your blood kin, as we call it down in fun, when you get to the point that your blood kin is willing to offer you up, you have problems, big problems. I think that's where Trump finds himself, that even his blood kin and so-called close friends I don't even know who he can call a close friend at this particular point in his life. But they are about to see that this show is about to come to an end. Uh, and the music going to stop. And the question is going to be, who doesn't have a seat? Uh, and uh, they don't want to be the guy without the seat when the music stops. So they're trying to get themselves together. I think you amply put it when you talked about Kushner. And the fact that he's got a lot to cover up here, uh, and uh, he may have already made some deals. We don't know uh, or what deals have been made or whatever. But I agree with uh, the, the reporting on this that there had to be somebody in. This is an inside deal, inside job, as we used to call it. Uh, somebody said, hey, this is where everything is. It's in room 105B, and it's behind the couch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is where the big box is, the big brown box behind the couch. And this is what's in it. <laughs> okay. Uh, th that happened. And uh, if that happened in that way, uh, Trump should be really afraid. I think he is uh, dumb enough, Ed to really rely on those adjectives that I listed and enumerated earlier about being a strike, a straight white male Christian, you know, who uh, just happens to have been, is the immediate past president. He thinks that's gonna be his shelter from this storm that's right at his doorstep. He thinks he's gonna ride that all the way to his grave, that nobody's ever gonna touch him. He thinks he's smart enough uh, to to get the the best lawyers in the world uh, to to uh, represent him, and he may or may not pay them after it's all over, but he thinks he's that much above the law. He thinks he's untouchable, and mm -hmm. every time something like this goes down, and you look back three or four months later, and nothing's happening, we are on to some other allegation. Every time that happens, you're making this guy stronger. But I go back to my uh, prognostication that I made on your show earlier when I said that I had a vision of Mr. Donald Trump having a suit that matched his complexion. It was orange. And he was perp walking uh, with a, a, a sport coat over his arms to hide the cuffs. And uh, he was going to a place they call jail. And well, I still think that's going to happen. Well, you know, based on what kind of stuff they say that they were looking for and what they may have found, uh, it's very serious. You know, we, we joke about it a little bit because uh, I think sometimes Donald Trump comes across as a cartoon, right? He, he, he's playing a part. He, he, he's played different parts in his life. He's played a developer. He's played a, 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 a clothing salesman when he was selling his ties. He played a wrestler on WWE. He's played the president. He never really wanted to be the president. But let's talk about what's dangerous about this vow. Uh, there's a guy named Ricky Schiffers who tried to attack the FBI building in Cincinnati uh, and uh, with a nail gun and an AR-15. And he didn't get in and, and they chased him. Let's take a look at the video from that from a station local in Cincinnati and then we'll talk about it. An armed man who allegedly tried to break into FBI Cincinnati field office was shot and killed by police during an hours long standoff today. Ohio State Highway Patrol says officers shot him dead about 345 this afternoon. The FBI now says it is investigating the agent involved with the shooting and law enforcement sources told ABC News the suspect has been identified as 42 year old Ricky Schiffer. 
So what do we know about this man? According to CNN, a social media account with his name shows a post made referencing an attempt to storm an FBI office. It was published on Truth Social, Donald Trump's platform. This post was made minutes after Ohio Highway Patrol say the incident at the FBI office began. Minutes later, the user made another post saying, quote, it is true. I tried attacking the FBI. So, Val, here's my fear. Uh, there are people who are crazy enough to think they're acting on behalf of Donald Trump. And this Mr. Ricky Schiffers is one of those people. He was prolific on on truth media, truth social, whatever you want to, truth social, uh, whatever. I, I've been on, I actually have an account on there, by the way. Uh, and, and he was prolific on there. He was at the January 6th. He was, he was linked to Oath Keepers and Proud Boys. And then he goes to try to attack the FBI building in Cincinnati. Do you have any fears that there are enough of these people to actually foment enough violence, maybe not to lead to a civil war, but to cause enough disruption in the country that it's problematic or will we continue to have these one-offs like Mr. Ricky Schiffers in Cincinnati? I, I think uh, it's uh, we are at a very dangerous point here because what the Ricky Schiffers don't really understand is that there is a point at which Merrick Garland and other people in the Justice Department and the FBI uh, and the military and in the White House says enough is enough. And before they just sit back and allow rounds to be fired at Fort Sumter and do absolutely nothing, before they allow that, they will fire back. And the firing back here, they already got lists and lists and lists, Ed, of people who are on a no-fly list because of their association with certain domestic uh, terrorist activities. They got people that they knew about. They knew about this man before he even picked up the nail gun. Uh, he participated in the 1-6 insurrection. They got lists. The first thing you wanna see is a lot of people are going to uh, witness firsthand what the Jap American, uh, Japanese Americans witnessed in 1942. In 1942, after the Japanese Navy bombed Pearl Harbor, Japanese Americans, people who were born here, not naturally, uh, didn't become a citizen by naturalization. They were actually born here and were American citizens. They were ushered off into concentration camps. And they never, some of those people who are in their 90s and 100s right now and lived through that, never got over that. And they never will. And you could see something similar here, Ed. I hate to be alarmist, but nobody's going to sit back and let those kind of people destroy America without us coming back and doing something for, to protect this country and our way of life. So I, I look to see those people arrested in huge numbers. Uh, it, it's just like when I was living in DC in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, there were plans uh, for large demonstrations that the Black Panthers and the NOI and uh, the Weathermen and uh, the SDS and all of those kind of people were participating in. They were anti-establishment kind of folks. There were plans to open up what was RFK Stadium at that time and the DC Armory outlet and put these people in pens and just hold them there for as long as uh, uh, 30 to 90 days. All of these things are possible, man. People don't know what they're playing with. They're playing with fire. And we'll lock them up and find out what's happening later before we sit back and let them destroy this country, our, our system of government, and our way of life. Well, well that's a mouthful. I, I, I hope that we don't get there, but I suspect there are Ricky Schiffers out there. I mean, that's what the whole 1-6 committee hearing is about. 
there were idiots that thought they were going to go to D.C. and force Congress to uh, keep Donald Trump as president. And, then, and, we, and we keep seeing these midterm election primaries where, where people who support that lie are being nominated by the Republican Party. And like I said, we saw people like Lindsey Graham and Rick Scott say out loud that there was a problem with Merrick Garland in the raid, that it may be politically motivated, when in fact, this clearly is a criminal enterprise that was being run from the White House and Donald Trump was the ringleader. Hey, uh, Val, I hear some music. Let's take a break and when we come back, I want to finish up with Donald Trump because he paid a visit to New York City last week. He, he went to meet his sister named Letitia. And let's talk about what they were talking about when we get back. We'll take a break. We'll be right back after this message. <laughs> 76% of women who were murdered by a partner were stalked first. If you are a victim of stalking or know someone who is, don't wait. Call the National Hotline today at 1-800-799-SAFE or visit thehotline.org to get your freedom back. Mr. President, what's your message to your supporters, Mr. President? Donald Trump didn't answer questions in public, nor did he behind closed doors. Shortly after arriving at the office of New York State Attorney General Letitia James, Trump took the fifth invoking his constitutional right not to incriminate himself. For four hours, he replied, quote, same answer to each of her inquiries. It's a far cry from the Donald Trump of 2016. You see, the mob takes the fifth. If you're innocent, why are you taking the Fifth Amendment? In a statement, Trump defended his flip-flop, saying, when your family, your company, and all the people in your orbit have become the targets of an unfounded, politically motivated witch hunt, you have no choice. Hey, welcome back to the second second video. I can't even contain myself. I was just watching this clip of Donald Trump visiting New York City to visit his buddy Letitia James Val, who is the <laughs> this, this is the Attorney General for the state of New York. And the problem here is Donald Trump at the end of that clip says the only people who take the fifth are people in the mob. So Val, so I can get myself together, I believe he talk. How did he get from anybody who takes the fifth as part of the mob to I'm taking the fifth on everything Letitia James asked him? One thing that you have to understand about Donald Trump Ed, is Donald Trump is classified as what we used to call, he's a short term salesman, okay? if. If a guy is in sales and he figures that whether you buy or refuse to buy that, you'll never see him again. You can tell him any kind of lie you want and it doesn't matter. And that's how Donald Trump deals with people. He feels that I can lie to you and then once the case is decided, I'm not going to have to deal with you anymore. I'll go on and be about trying to sell the next food something that didn't hurt what we're talking about here. And uh, he's gotten away with that. Donald Trump is 76 years old. And he has managed to get away with it from the beginning when he was born on third base and thought he hit a trip. In the beginning. And from then until now, he's gotten away with everything. And he's thinking in his mind right now that he can claim the fifth, Ed. And he can say, uh, the only people that claim the fifth are people who are guilty. And some people are not going to hear that. He thinks that the people that matter is not going to hear that. And he can get up there and say that and move on to another subject and have people to do. He thinks he is in control of the narrative. If it gets too hot, he figures he can say, well, Obama's got records too. And he believes that now the Justice Department said, well, we better go investigate Obama. Let's leave Trump alone. Uh, he has gotten away with that. He thinks that that's the way the world operates. And that explains why he does this kind of stuff. 
don't be surprised at anything this guy says or does regarding the Constitution, uh, what he used to do, what he will do in the future. This Letitia James thing is going to be interesting yeah, because it's not over by any stretch of the imagination. And there are some other people that spoke to that that you haven't talked about yet that they could be coming up for issues as well. Kushner, some of the other relatives of his, some other people that were in business with him. This is uh, a hot potato. Yeah, you know, Val, I bought a new popcorn popper uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I, I think I'm gonna be able to put it to good use because there should be plenty of entertainment between the federal charges. This New York thing is completely different, I, and I don't know if people think this through, but, you know, Letitia James has nothing to do with Merrick Garland's case. These are completely different things. So now Trump is being bombarded from all these different places. Uh, while you were talking, it made me think about uh, how Trump has successfully been able to shield himself, but may not be able to shield others, right? And the others that I'm thinking about uh, is, uh, say, somebody like Ted Budd, who's running against Sherry Beasley in North Carolina for Senate. And those people who've attached their coattails to Donald Trump where to the point where they have nothing else to run on other than I, I'm attached to Donald Trump. And now that things are happening, and, and I know this is a curveball, but it, it kind of fits into the discussion. If Donald Trump keeps getting hammered from all these different angles and he's, he's, he's having to respond, and he can't come to rallies it, uh, and, and help these candidates out, or he can come, but he spends all the time talking about how he's aggrieved, right? Is it possible that it becomes counterproductive for these people to continue to drag Donald Trump along with them to campaign rallies and events and use him in their ads? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's counterproductive already it, because one of the things that we have to keep in mind, uh, there's only about a third of the people out there that call themselves Republicans even or conservatives that are going to be with Donald Trump hell or high water uh, come rain or shine. It doesn't matter. These are the old Tea Party folks, folks. But in order for Donald Trump to get elected and be popular, he's got to get some of these people we used to call swing voters, independents, and those kind of people. They are not going to be moved easily by Donald Trump's success or whatever. They are more pragmatic than some of the other one third that I just mentioned. And they won't vote for Bud over Beasley simply because Donald Trump says so. They want to see some facts. They want to see the, the results of, you may have to loan them your abacus, uh, Ed, that you go to from time to time to try to figure out these races. But, uh, I, I think he's about reached the end of his rope in terms of convincing uh, some uh, pragmatic, practical thinking people that they ought to vote for candidate X because it, it be, that because is not working anymore. Democrats are in a better position right now Ed, than they think they are. Because a lot of people that went out and voted for Donald Trump in 2016 and 2020, they would not, they are not only not going to support him if he runs for office again, they are not going to support the kinds of people that he is supporting and, and is suggesting that they support. Uh, I think the Republican Party is in a bad way. They're in a bad place. I'm going to be the last one that's surprised if they go the way of the old Whig party. And yeah. they said they started in 1854. They may have their demise as early as 2024. We don't know. Yeah, well, I'm glad you uh, gave us a way to segue out for Donald Trump uh, into the prospects for the Democratic Party. But before we uh, go that direction, I want to remind folks you're watching and listening to the deal. As I said before, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you tell other people about us. Spotify pod, uh, podcast platform is where we live, but we also live on Anchor and Google Podcast and all those other places, Stitcher. 
uh, in uh, anywhere you can find podcasts. Val, uh, you know, you're talking about the political prospects of the Democrats maybe improving a little bit. One of the other things that may improve their prospects is uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, it, it, it is the, I think, the uh, stepchild of Build Back Better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and perhaps uh, Mitch McConnell, your buddy, got played. Let's look at a clip uh, that talks about the Inflation Reduction Act and its passing, and then we'll talk about maybe how the Democrats can use this to their advantage, but also how it may advantage people at large. Good evening. This bill has been more than 18 months in the making. Democrats say just getting this far is a victory. But Republicans return to Washington today united in opposition. The motion is adopted. The Inflation Reduction Act cleared the House on Friday. If you are sitting at your kitchen table and wonder how you're going to pay the bills, your health care bills, your uh, prescription drug bills, this bill's for you. Democrats praise their bill as life-changing legislation. It is a really big deal. The Inflation Reduction Act is going to dramatically improve the lives of everyday Americans. The bill fights climate change and lowers some prescription drug prices and is estimated to raise over $300 billion over 10 years in new tax revenue. This is the bill. So, well, Nancy Pelosi is all happy. Uh, she, she, uh, and then uh, you see, uh, uh, you know, Hakeem Jeffries and other Democrats touting how this is going to help people, so on and so forth. Uh, we thought, I did. I'm telling you, I did. I thought Bill Back Better was dead. Uh, Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema had, you know, uh, poisoned the Kool Aid, uh, and we were at Jonestown, Guyana, and there was a whole bunch of dead people laying around because uh, uh, nobody was going to live after Joe Manchin killed off Bill Back Better. Nevertheless, we get this bill that, by all accounts, does a lot. Uh, first, uh, talk to me about uh, the provisions in it and some of the things that aren't in it that I'm not happy about, like insulin prices not being controlled for people who are on private insurance. But talk to me about the provisions and talk to me about how the Democrats can use this to their advantage. Well, talking about the provisions first, uh, first of all, I hate to throw cold water on, on such a high topic for the Democrats, but, you know, if you're a progressive, which I am, uh, you know, this is nothing near what progressive wanted in the beginning. When we were told, okay, go along with us, on this deal here so that we can get the first part back and we'll throw all of this stuff in that you want uh, about the qualified immunity and da 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 that you need for your progressive people that you can get them back to the poll and none of that happened yes we got the environmental stuff that's fine we got some tax stuff that's fine but the things that makes progressive get up and want to holler, uh, it, it ain't there. It just ain't there. We got to force ourselves to do this. I am interested in what Schumer and Manchin talked about. And, you know, Schumer's going around taking victory laps and talking about he they made a deal, him and Manchin. What did he promise Manchin? He's going to shine his shoes every day? Uh, is he going to make him assistant uh, leader? Uh, in, in the Senate, what's going on? We'll see coming up a little later, but the guy's already a Democrat. That, you know, I don't know what he's complaining about. Getting back to North Carolina, to home again, here he is. I am concerned that we may be blowing our whistle and tutor now on a little too soon. We just lost a court case a couple of days ago when the judge ruled that the Green Party can be on the ballot because Democrats were fighting to prevent that from happening because you've got some people out there who are saying, I don't like Democrats, I don't like Republicans, so I may not even go vote. Now this is allowing them to actually cast a vote and not for Republican and not for Democrat. Democrats don't like that. Uh, so that this is a piece that has not shown its head yet and we don't know how that's going to impact 
the Bud uh, Beasley uh, election uh, come November. So I'm just not so sure. I have never been convinced in the first place that you got all of these swing voters and Democrats saying Trump, Biden, Trump, Biden. I don't know. There's six in one hand, half dozen in another. And I don't know who to vote for. And tell, tell me a little bit more what you've done for us, Biden. So why should I vote for you? If you, if if that's the, the waiting thing, then I have mis really understood the American electorate. If you think it, it, Biden and Trump is about 50-50 and you need an environmental bill to get you to vote for Biden over Trump, I, I don't know how to read you. I, I don't know where you are coming from. With, with, it is much different between Biden and Trump it is his day and night. And this whole thing about uh, getting a, 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 a few more solar panels up and windmills and uh, moving from fossil fuels to uh, electric vehicles and that kind of thing. Is, is is that the only thing that's stopping you from, from voting for a dollar Trump? I don't understand it. I don't yeah, I, I, I find that very dubious too, Val, if that's, if that's the only thing that's motivating you that you could make a decision based on that. But, you know, let's talk about brass tacks here. Uh, th- th- let's talk about that decision about the Green Party. We live in this weird kind of governmental form that I don't think anybody else in the whole world does. Everybody else is either a dictator or a monarchy or they're a parliamentary system, right? And and here we've staked all our stuff on this two-party system. And then when a third party comes in, it really disrupts everything and makes everything really, really crazy. Because there's very few instances where a Green Party has won anywhere other than on a very local level, right? But when they get involved in a general election, they throw a monkey wrench in it. And particularly when it's a statewide race, because they they leech votes off the progressive side as if the same thing would happen, say, if there was a libertarian candidate that perhaps could leech votes off on the the right. Uh, So uh, talk to me real quick. Uh, before we run out of time in this segment, what is the outcome going to be then? What do you What do you think is actually going to happen? I mean, I know I know the rulings there. Uh, what can the Democrats do to try to solidify the people who are behind them to and, and, and remind them that you know voting for a, a potential Green Party Senate candidate who has no hope of getting more than one or two percent isn't going to do anything for you other than maybe assuage your conscience, right? Because isn't that what that always comes down to? They always say, well, I'm voting my conscience and, and not voting for the party. I wouldn't even fool with the whole Green Party piece. I wouldn't let that be a part of my strategy. And I would go the other way and put more eggs in the basket of turnout. I would just try to flood. I would educate more people on this is what you need to do if they employ this tactic of voter suppression. And you need to understand this portion of the law as to what they can and can't do, trying to get you to leave early or telling you you can't do X or Y. I would do a lot of that, uh, you know, educate the people, make sure everybody takes at least two other people to the poll with them, uh, a, a, a kind of thing that I told the uh, people of Delta Sigma Theta, when I made a talk to them about voting, I said, ladies, make sure you and your daughters ask these young men when they ask them out for a date, ask them if they are registered to vote and if they are planning on voting and where their precinct is. So we got to put pressure on each other. And that's, that, that's one of the things that can be done. I wouldn't go after the Green Party at all. I would really amp and ramp up the whole voter turnout list. Well, Val, you just you just ruined some dating prospects for some young men. <laughs> I don't know if they're gonna like you all that much. Uh, you know what? I hear some music again. Let's take a break. When we come back, we gotta we wanna finish up with two stories that are that are important in their own right. We wanna talk about inflation, but I also wanna talk about football. The NFL uh, has finally acquiesced to 
uh, changing some rules about how they compensate players who may have had head injuries. So stay right there. We'll be right back after this message. <clears throat> You're not going to get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. And welcome back to our third and final segment of the deal. I'm Ed Clark. That is Val Atkinson. Hey, Val. <laughs> he's, been, he's been hanging in there with us today. Uh, we had some fun in the first segment because we were talking about the prospects of the orange man wearing an orange jumpsuit. Uh, and it seems even closer to reality than it's ever has before. But there's a dark side to that because a guy named Ricky Schiffers uh, took it upon himself to try to attack the FBI office in Cincinnati. Uh, the only person that ended up dead was Mr. Schiffers. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know what, how, how tormented he was, but he believed Donald Trump. And, and that's the dangerous part, isn't it, Val, that, that there are people who would act on this. We also talked about uh, Donald Trump invoking the Fifth Amendment. Well, why would you do that? Only criminals do that. Only people in the mob invoke the Fifth Amendment. Uh, and then we talked about how the Democrats who dude Mitch McConnell and got the Inflation Reduction Act passed, which is sort of a, what, a 75%, would you say, Val, uh, of the uh, Build Back Better plan. Uh, it, it's sort of a scaled down version. So now that leaves us, Val, with uh, the knock on effect of COVID and of the legacy of the tax cuts for the very rich from Donald Trump. It's inflation. Now, yesterday, uh, I had to fill up the, the, the car with gas, and it was about, overall, when I filled it up, it was about eight or nine dollars cheaper than just a week before when I filled it up. And then I looked over at the pump and on the regular side, I have to use premium gas in my car, but on the regular side at the station I was at, the gas was at three nineteen a gallon. Uh, let's look at a clip about inflation itself and then we'll talk about that. You're gonna tell me are we gonna into a recession or not? On a hot and steamy summer day, word that inflation remains hot, but maybe losing steam was welcome news at the White House. Jobs are booming and Americans are working, and we're seeing some signs that inflation may be getting to moderate. The administration under pressure to tame inflation before the midterm elections in November. The good news, gas prices have dropped a dollar after hitting an all-time high in June, now averaging 401 a gallon nationally and could fall below $4 this week. And airfares have dropped nearly 8% in a month. But Americans are still paying for sticker shock on just about everything compared to a year ago. Gas prices still up 44%. Those airline ticket prices up 28%. Food up 11%. And the average household will spend $864 on back-to-school shopping this year. Clothing, sneakers, backpacks, all more expensive. In Miami... So, well, gas prices are down. I already told you about my experience with the seeing the 319 gas. Uh, yes, prices are up on some products, but the overall inflation number came down a little bit. When you look across the board, the folks over at the stock market, they ain't all that worried. They still making money hand over fist. Uh, I, I can look out the window right here in the studio and Val, there's a $380 million complex going up right here. There's a big hole in the ground, $380 million shopping complex going up. And there are multiple ones within a mile of here that are at least $300 million. And then we saw in the report that unemployment still remains low. Now the number ticked up a little bit, but it's still under 4%, which by all accounts means you're not in a recession. So what's the deal, Val? Who Are we being lied to? Were, were people saying that prices had to go up on housing and all that stuff because they were greedy and wanted to make money? To be sure, American business people don't do that. 
I think you're wrong on that. <laughs> but at any rate, we, we, we take this back to its origin, back to the beginning. And this whole thing started when the right, when Republicans felt that they had a campaign issue here. They could wrap this whole inflation thing around the neck of Joe Biden and make him responsible by himself for world inflation. Everything that happened for the supply chain, uh, for the grain not growing in Ukraine and not being shipped, uh, for everything, for the people not being able to uh, get over the wall down in Texas and then go pick, uh, you know, fruit at a, a very low wage. All of that stuff is Joe Biden's fault, you know? So that's what they were using it, and we fell right into that. And everything on the newscast was, well, inflation this, inflation that, and we need to try this, and we need to do that, and so forth. Uh, but again, I go back to your advocates deal, Ed, how many people out there are going to say, I like Joe Biden's policies, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to put fuel in my car or heat my home this winter. So I'm going to vote for Donald Trump and his people because they are better at business and, and they can do things that will keep me warm and keep a little money in my pocket when I go to the gas uh, pump, you know? I think people are smarter than that, Ed. And I think uh, those right-wingers and other people who are depending upon the average American just looking at his back bottom line in his bank account and say, I'm going to vote Republican because I got less money in my savings account than I used to have. I, I, don't, I think that day is, is about having its run. I think people are smarter than that, and I think they are more pragmatic than that. And I think they're going to say, I got to vote for my children's children's way of life. That's more important than saving $9 at the gas pump right now, okay? Let's make things, uh, let's make some smart decisions here. And let's not let these conservatives tell me, hey, man, you're, you, you're broke. You don't have any money. I know it's hard, man. You can't feed yourself. And so you need to vote for Republicans, you know? To tell these Democrats that they ain't doing a good job. Vote Republican. We're businessmen, you know? And yeah. uh, I, I, I just think it, that uh, they're going to get surprised. And the average American is not going to fall for that anymore. Well, I, I hope they I hope they do get a surprise, Val, and I hope people turn away from that nonsense that, you know, we're in this perpetual crisis and spiraling down because we want to ensure that people have health care and drugs don't cost too much and so on and so forth. You know, part of the old saw with the uh, uh, Republicans, and, and we can date, date this back to Newt Gingrich at least, uh, with his contract with America was that he was going to scare the bejesus out of uh, working class white people to make them think that, that their life was in imminent danger if, for example, you tried to help people with anything, health care, uh, child care, any of that stuff. But what, what they fail to realize, Val, is you got to have people to do those jobs. Uh, I mean, you talked about the fruit pickers or whatever, right? They, 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 they run the scam about the border being scary and all these people coming over. But the last time I looked, the people who hire those immigrant workers are rich corporate farmers. Mm -hmm. They're not. Uh, when's the last time you hired a truckload of uh, immigrants from Central America or Mexico, Val? You don't need you don't need to hire those people. A corporate farmer does because he wants to keep his bottom line where it is. He wants to make as, as much money as he can using the cheapest labor he can. And it goes the same for your favorite restaurant you go to. You go to the back of the bar, you look who's working there. The people that they can charge the least amount. Go to your fast food restaurants. Look who's working there. But instead, we try to tell people that your life is almost over. America's going to lose their way of life. 
Before I get off this subject, because I want to talk about one more important thing before we leave, Val, I have a question for you, though. If America has always had this thing that business has to be better year over year, right? This whole thing about, okay, here are my numbers for this quarter, and next quarter they're going to be, you know, 25% gain, and if I don't get that, something's wrong. Yeah. Where did that come from, Val? When did we start worrying about that? Because I, I got to tell you, when the country first started, they couldn't have been worried about that because there was no stock market or anything. And then when the stock market got created, even then that wasn't such a big deal because there weren't these large countrywide corporations. There was when you got bread, that bread was made where you were. There wasn't you know a Wonder Bread that was all over the country. What is this thing that we got to have these astronomical gains year after year and if we don't then we're failing instant gratification it covers all of our lives not just financial or economic uh we want it in our medical life uh we want it in our social life in our family life everything we want it now uh and and with the uh, social media being uh prominently displayed in our lives anymore. We got to have it right now. We can't sell anybody a stock saying when your child graduates college or when your child that's three years old right now buys his first house, you know, this is what your account's going to look like. Nobody wants to do that. But if I tell you three months from now, you will have realized a 10.5% increase in your initial outlay now you enter you know people want to hear about that so it's all in sales people are selling this idea that we can make money hand over fist and you won't have to worry about you just made 10 percent on this amount of money today because three months later in the next quarterly report you're going to make another 10 percent on that and we estimate that over the next four quarters your real uh, earnings will be a round number of about 13.8%. Uh, and that sells. Where do I sign? And uh, it's gotten to the point that it's out of hand here. Yeah, it is out of hand. And I, I just hope that people stop buying into this thing where I have to give rich people a tax break or else I won't be okay. I, I think part of it, Val, also is, uh, you know, the lottery got up to $1.2 billion a few weeks ago. It, it's that dream that all Americans have is that they're going to be rich at some point, right? They're going to be that person that has all this money. And and and, and we're, we're just told that over and over again. We don't ever talk about, you know, do you have enough to survive and do you have enough to live? Or, you know, are you fine just the way you are? Because guess yeah. what, Val? We all going to go out of here with nothing. <laughs> same way we came in. Uh, same way you came in. Uh, so let's put a pin in that. Because there is one other story I want to talk about today, Val. It's almost feet ball season. American football. Uh, the, the, and the big boys that play in the NFL that make a whole bunch of money um, uh, are, uh, you know, Kicked off the season, the Hall of Fame game got played. Now you can turn on the TV just about any night, and there's a constant uh, barrage of uh, you know talk about the season. And uh, and tonight you'll be able to watch the uh, Washington Commanders. <laughs> I still can't <laughs> Washington Commanders, whatever, dude. The Washington Commanders versus the uh, Carolina Panthers in a preseason fo football game. Uh, but Val, let's look at this clip and let's talk about the dark side of football well it's been a long time coming um and i'm really just eager for it just to 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 come to fruition it's a stunning new development in the landmark nfl concussion settlement program a deal that was supposed to pay eligible former players suffering from the lingering effects of head injuries but former nfl player lewis leonard and his wife lacy are among those who say the compensation program has been discriminatory, denying payouts to some qualified black former players What's going on, buddy? by using a controversial medical practice known as race norming. 
It's a formula that assumes black players start at a lower cognitive level than white players, making it harder for black players to receive payouts. Are you really advocating for these players who are driving the dollars for the NFL? No. The NFL really, really needs to give these families justice. Now, months after an ABC News investigation of the program, the NFL and former players have not only reached an agreement to eliminate race norming going forward, but they will also review and reevaluate past cases that may have been denied due to race norming, like Lewis's. I felt like I have got the short end of the stick along with a lot of other of my brothers in, in battle. There's no so doubt. Val, that was actually from earlier this year on Nightline on ABC, and, and they had been following some NFL players who uh, had uh, have significant injury. And a lot of these football players end up with head injury, CTE. Uh, and some of them have committed suicide. Some of them have gone completely berserk and done crazy stuff, right? Uh, and and what we found out, Val, in the story alludes to is that the, it, that the National Football League, when they evaluated black players for, for you know additional medical treatment or whatever else, in the past the rule was, well, Negroes ain't as smart anyway. So cognitive decline is harder to determine in colored folk because they ain't smart. Isn't yeah. that the bottom line, Val? Isn't that what they had been saying? That's exactly what they were saying. And I'm glad they were uh, at least smart enough themselves, Ed, to go back and revisit this and change uh, all of that methodology so that not only people that are getting uh, examined today, but going back in the past, some of those guys that were examined and not found to be qualified to receive benefits, thank goodness they are being looked at again and they may be able to be uh, able to receive benefits now. It's about time that the National Football League, that, that's almost 80% black now Ed, in terms of its players, take a look at who's buttering your bread for you, Mr. Owner. Who's making you all of these uh, billions of dollars? And how are you treating them? Uh, and this whole business about the cognitive levels of sudden people and their races makes it so that uh, you got to treat them differently when you're trying to determine if they've been hurt or not uh, is, is ridiculous. It's more than ridiculous, Val. And, you know, I think, you know, we talk about sports on here from time to time. You know, both, both you and I, you know, play sports at a fairly high level. We also like to watch sports. We like to watch the pro leagues, uh, NFL, NBA, uh, certainly college basketball. We talk about a lot here. We talk about golf even to some extent. I've talked about the sports that I've played. I've played some alternative sports like rugby, uh, ran track and field, and was involved in track and field at a fairly high level. And one of the things that uh, I always try to remind people, especially when you're looking at uh, professional sports leagues is, it's a business. These people are trying to make as much money as possible. <laughs> They're trying to make as much money as possible. And in the past, when they could get away with it, they would use people. And in the case, they used a whole bunch of Negroes, and a lot of them went to their grave dead without being fairly compensated, Val. Because when, when, when the Dan Snyders and all the other billionaires, because you have to be a billionaire to own a professional football team in America, uh, when they go to do their taxes, uh, you know, they're always looking for a break or a write-off or to maintain their nonprofit status because NFL has special exemption on a lot of tax stuff that you probably don't know about. Uh, and, and, and But there are real lives. There are, there are real lives being impacted by uh, what happens in Sport Val in uh, some people have not fared well uh, after playing football and being hit in the head a lot. Well, uh, I'll I'll end it there. Uh, guess what? I'll probably watch the Washington Commanders and the Panthers tonight. Yeah. At the same time, uh, I, I have a jaundiced eye, right? I, I, I'm looking at it at, for what it is. Uh, it's entertainment, and they need to do better. Uh, hey, Val, guess what we do always? I always ask you, what do I have to look forward to? Anything you want to tell me? Anything you're working on? 
what's going on? Well, as usual, our little sister program called Connections is going to be coming on uh, in a little over a week, uh, in exactly one week. So we ask you to tune in to them. Uh, so Radio One Deal, Urban One, uh, Foxy 107104, WFXC, WFXK are the call letters. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Ed Clark is co-hosting that show as well. Uh, and Herb Jonah is our legal analyst and contributor. So we want you to come in and take a listen. And we are talking about the issues of the day. And you get a chance to write in, uh, email in, text in, some questions and comments of your own. That's called Connections. Well, Val, you hang out with some shady ass people. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> Uh, you know, you know, Val. Uh, we started out today talking about some shady people. Uh, we talked about Donald Trump, who may have been, who may just be the shadiest president ever in the whole history of the United States. I'll go out on a limb and say he's the worst by far. Uh, he he was the, the the least qualified, certainly in my lifetime and your lifetime, Val. But perhaps in the whole history of the United States of America, uh, I want people to think about this. Uh, be, be very committed to uh, participating in the midterm elections uh, because uh, there are people on the ballot like Ted Budd, like Herschel Walker, uh, who would make your life miserable. And the only thing they have to say for themselves is that they have the support of Donald Trump. Uh, and and we're, we're ending on a fairly somber note here because I think it's a, just, I think it's a serious thing to think about. So uh, the sun is shining though, at least where I am. And uh, so that means, uh, and the weather's supposed to be a little bit cooler. So I, I would like for you guys to go out to the farmer's market today, uh, support a local business today, spend some time with your kids today, do something else other than uh, worry about the inflation that isn't real uh, and all that other stuff. And then come back with us next Saturday for another edition of the Thanks a lot.